Hello students and welcome to my AP Biology video on Unit 4, Cell Communication in the Cell Cycle. This unit has a lot of information in it and a lot of cool labs. I hope you enjoyed it. Just like all my other videos, this is not for profit. Um, and I try to use uh, open uh, Creative Commons images from OpenStax and Khan Academy. I encourage you to check out open, OpenStax and Khan Academy for good practice. Once you make it through Unit 4, you're halfway through AP Biology, so congratulations. Um, do remember that you need to practice all of the content in all the units paired up with the biological skills, the scientific skills, uh, such as developing hypotheses, testing them with statistics, constructing explanations, etc. All right, here we go for topic 4.1, cellular communication. You see the uh, learning objectives over there on the left. Here's my question for you. Can you describe and model ways that cells communicate with one another over short and long distances? I encourage you to pause the video and to actually make that model um, and to see if you can do it. So here we are, right? Our cells don't really have cell phones, um, but they need to be able to talk to each other. So you're made of trillions of cells yourself. How, do, uh, how does your brain communicate with your adrenal glands to send out adrenaline, et cetera? Here are the forms of uh, cellular signaling or chemical signaling. There's autocrine, where a cell will target itself. There is juxtacrine, where a cell will uh, talk to or signal a cell that is uh, touching, and it does this through gap junctions. There is paracrine signaling, where a cell will signal a nearby cell. And a special branch of paracrine signaling is called synaptic signaling between nerve cells. There is endocrine signaling, which I'm sure you've heard of, um, with uh, the different endocrine glands, such as the hypothalamus or the pituitary gland, sending out hormones throughout the bloodstream to different target cells to elicit a response. We'll see some examples. So autocrine might be developmental cells. So as the cell starts as a zygote and it starts to divide, it might be uh, inducing itself to do something. Um, cancer cells as well, and bacteria, which I'll give an example of in a second. For juxtacrine or the touching signaling, a good example of this are macrophages and helper T cells. And we'll deal with the immune response with this. So a macrophage is a cell that picks up an antigen, something that's invaded your body, and it will go to a helper T cell and start the immune response. Uh, neurotransmitters such as acetylcholine or dopamine or oxytocin would be a good example of synaptic or paracrine signaling. And in endocrine signaling, you can think about insulin or human growth hormones. So uh, the pancreas and endocrine glands sending out insulin throughout the body so that your cells can intake glucose and begin the process of cellular respiration. A little trick for remembering this are uh, underneath his blankie here, my son had us on his PJs. And so PJs, paracrine, endocrine, autocrine, juxtacrine, synaptic, your PJs of cellular communication. In the AP test, I don't think you're going to need to just remember the name of the signaling. I don't, that's not something they're going for. They're much more going for a model of here's a cell, here's a mutation in a receptor, what's going to happen, uh, what's a downstream effect, et cetera. But just a little one that I thought I'd throw in there. So I have the examples a little more in depth from uh, what I just did over here on the right. So let's look at them real quickly. So some autocrine ones, uh, I'll just do bacteria right here. And so here would be bacteria. And let's say that these are bioluminescent bacteria. So they're going to uh, generate light, right? And so that's going to cost the uh, bacterium energy. And so it needs to do this when it's at a density of bacteria that is uh, beneficial to the population. So here, the autoinducer is uh, secreted, but due to Brownian motion, due to random diffusion, it's just going to diffuse away from the cell. But if it's in a high enough um, density, and if they all start signaling, then there will be a strong enough signal that they will auto-induce themselves to then bioluminesce or to make light. And so this is what happens in the Hawaiian bobtail uh, squid. And so it's when their bacteria are at high enough uh, density, they'll start to bioluminesce and the squid will light up. And so the squid can actually use that to um, camouflage itself in the water at nighttime. It can mimic uh, the moon passing through it, which is pretty cool. This also works with uh, cholera and with uh, staph infections, which I have here. All right, juxtacrine. Remember that juxtacrine was they were touching each other and they were passing messages through gap junctions. So think about your heart. Your heart has uh, beating cells and they're passing uh, messages between 
um, gap junction channels that are open, so electrical signals uh, from the pacemaker. And then the immune response. So here we have the macrophage, and let's say that it ate um, a invader, such as the flu or something. And so it's going to then um, put the antigen or what marks it as non-self, something that it's an invader to the, to the body, to this helper T cell. And this helper T cell will then take that and will activate B cells in your lymph nodes um, to send out antibodies in what's called the humoral response. And then in the cell mediated response, it will make killer T cells that will go off and hunt them. So I would like to shout out Mr. Rowland, a uh, second grade teacher here at TASM and my friend. And here we are in uh, Bangkok going to a professional development conference. You see, look, I had no hair then, now I have hair, just my COVID hair. Um, and then here we are in Dubai, enjoying uh, watching some rugby, which was fun. I learned a lot about rugby then. But what I wanted to shout out for him for was he sent me this article from Nature and their uh, journal, Signal Transduction and Targeted Therapy. That goes exactly with our AP Bio uh, Unit 4. And you can see this was published just in November 3rd uh, this year. Um, and it's going over a possible treatment for COVID-19, this terrible disease. And what it is, is if you click in the article, I'll link it in the YouTube minutes, but it goes over um, how SARS-CoV-2, uh, the virus that causes COVID-19 gets into um, your cells. And it's called receptor-mediated endocytosis. So SARS-CoV-2 comes to the receptor. Here it is. These are called the ACE2 receptors. ACE2 deals with blood pressure in your body. Um, the, it docks and it says, okay, um, there's a couple of enzymes called furin, some other stuff that uh, get to work, and then it brings the virus into your cell. Once it's in your cell, it's going to release its genetic material, which is RNA. That RNA will link up with ribosomes and immediately start making uh, SARS-CoV-2 proteins, such as the spike protein, It'll make the, um, the capsid to hold it together and it'll make more copies of its RNA. So um, we need to stop this, right? Um, you can't just block all the ACE2 receptors because they deal with blood pressure. So this is a great example of a ligand in a signal transduction pathway binding here. And the paper that Mr. Rowland sent me um, is showing how these recombinant molecules made by scientists, HRS, ACE2, can bind onto the spike protein of the coronavirus. So if it binds onto these spike proteins, then the virus itself will not bind onto the ACE2 receptors and come into the cell. So this would be an injection of, let's go back to his, the paper title, of this recombinant coming together, soluble ACE2 uh, uh, receptor that's going, that mimics the receptor and it's gonna bond to the coronavirus. So it's a pretty cool, idea there, right? And it's something that can be made and then administered to many people. Um, so, you know, this was a big hope. And then, you know, a couple of weeks later, we got the great news from Pfizer and um, from uh, Moderna about the potential for the vaccine. And it works in a similar way, right? And so the vaccine would uh, implant uh, mRNA into your cells, say your muscle cells, and then mRNA would be read by your ribosomes and make the spike protein. And so the spike protein would uh, not be attached to um, the coronavirus because it's just the protein, but it'd be this blue part right here. And if your macrophage picked it up and then presented it to a helper T cell, which then presents it to your lymph nodes and to your B cells, um, it would promote the immune response and it would make you you would generate lots of antibodies and you would generate uh, these T cells that go around hunting for uh, this spike protein. And so um, once you have that initial immune, immune response, you now will have a faster secondary immune response. So if you were to encounter um, COVID-19 or the SARS-CoV-2 virus, you'd be able to shut it down much more quickly. So thank you to Mr. Rowland, my friend. All right, here we go for some paracrine examples. Um, Here's an example of a neurotransmitter. Uh, and so um, in class, I did one with acetylcholine and how nicotine mimics that and why it's so hard to quit smoking. And then here is an example of a developing spinal cord. And so uh, remember that paracrine was nearby cells. 
So there would be a larger concentration of this signal right here. This is called the Sonic the Hedgehog signal, um, literally named after uh, Sonic Hedgehog. And scientists just trying to be funny. And it will, as it goes further away, there'll be less of the signal. So there'll become different types of neurons in the spinal cord. Fascinating. I encourage you to look it up. Um, some endocrine examples would be growth hormones, sex hormones, adrenaline, metabolism. Um, and so we dealt with uh, leptin in class. And um, uh, there will also be thyroxine and other uh, hormones as well. So lots of different fascinating ones here. Um, a tip to you as you get ready to take the AP test, you can't memorize all that stuff, right? You just need to do practice problems and see um, how the endocrine system works and then be able to apply the, the general knowledge of reception, transduction, and response, and then be able to interpret the problem. All right, let's move on to topic 4.2. You can see the learning objectives over here to the left. Here are my questions for you. Can you describe how a signal transduction pathway links cellular signal reception with a cellular response? And then given models, can you identify and describe the components of the signal transduction pathway and their effect on a cell? So let's dive in. First of all, we need to know intercellular versus intracellular. So inter means between. That's what that prefix means. And so between cells, we're sending a, a message from our pituitary gland throughout our body that uh, growth hormone, we need to grow. Or we're sending insulin that we need to bring in uh, glucose. Or we might be sending out glucagon that we need to uh, release uh, glucose into our body. And so intracellular is within cells responses. So once we get that inter between cellular communication, we'll then have a response. And so let's see it happen here. So this is the big picture. This is really important. Here comes the signal. It's called a ligand, and it's going to dock on the receptor. It will then start a signal transduction pathway. And this can take a couple of different ways. It can be a G protein a receptor that's going to activate um, adenylase cyclase, which will activate uh, the secondary messenger of CAM, which will go throughout the cell. Or it might be a tyrosine kinase, and there it will phosphorylate lots of other proteins that will activate a cellular response. Regardless of the pathway of signal transduction, it will do something in the cell. And that something might be the activation of an enzyme or the transcription of a gene. Not all receptors are on the cell membrane. Some receptors may be within the cell. So if you think about it, right, it would have to be a nonpolar uh, ligand to get past the, um, the cell membrane. Here's an example of a um, tyrosine kinase receptor. And so here, this is going to be epidermal growth factor. Um, what kinases do is they are going to transfer phosphate groups. And what I told my students in class is that phosphate groups make you do something. Phosphate groups are negatively charged. So here, if we take this phosphate group off of this ATP and put it on this protein, there's going to be a conformational change in this protein. It's going to go off and do work. One way to think about it is if you stick your fingers in somebody's armpit, you shouldn't touch anybody, it's COVID, right? But it makes them squiggle. Uh, it's something I just remember from a summer camp I went to. And so here, this uh, as the ligand uh, comes here and bonds with it, this epidermal growth factor is going to cause uh, the kinases to come together, and it's going to activate these different enzymes. And so here, RAF is then going to activate uh, MAPK, Notice how it becomes phosphorylated, which is going to phosphorylate and activate ERK. It can keep on going. And then eventually one of these can come into the nucleus and start the transcription of a gene. And that gene is going to transcribe to make cyclins and it's going to promote this uh, cell cycle. So signaling transduction pathways include protein modification and phosphorylation cascades. Um, here we go. So Let's think about that ligand. Remember, the ligand is the signaling molecule. It may be nonpolar or polar. If it's polar, it's got to dock with a receptor outside the membrane. Notice how this receptor, this part of it is going to be hydrophobic because it's on the interior of the membrane. These parts will be hydrophilic on the out part. That ties back to unit one, right, to protein structure. So here's an example of a G protein one. So in the previous slide, I had a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So here, signaling molecule hits the G protein uh, receptor. It's going to start a little domino effect here, and it will then trigger uh, the release of secondary messengers. 
Um, this ties into evolution, okay? Um, all organisms have signal transduction pathways. And so um, entire signaling pathways have been conserved between organisms. For example, a key pathway in eye development in humans is uh, completely analogous to one in fruit flies. So I thought that was pretty cool to put in there. This comes from a paper. Sorry, I missed the heading. I don't know where it went, um, but from NCBI. Here's a really important concept. Notice how one uh, signaling ligand can make a big response. And this is called amplification. And so look at this picture, it's beautiful. It shows how the ligand is gonna dock with the receptor and how it can activate these three uh, yellow kinases, which then activate much more blue ones, which activate many, many, many more green ones. And so it can amplify the response. Now you might say, why are there all these steps? Seems redundant. It seems like a waste of time. Well, it happens really fast and it gives the cell the ability to control what's going on here. And we'll see more about that later on. All right, let's talk about the secondary messengers real quick. Here is the G protein receptor shown again. And so here comes the ligand and it's gonna activate adenylase cyclase. This is going to convert ATP into CAM. And so it's gonna strip it of its two phosphates and becomes CAM, it becomes uh, cyclic AMP. The cyclic AMP will then activate these different kinases and uh, promote a cellular response. So you can think about them as like, have you ever sent your brother or your sister or a friend to go do something for you, right? And so here are some common secondary messengers, uh, cyclic AMP, calcium, PIP2. You don't need to memorize them. Um, PIP2 is a phospholipid. Um, so you often think about that as a cell membrane, but it can be cleaved into DAG and IP3. Here's an example of it. That DAG can then go off and phosphorylate other proteins. IP3 here can activate the opening of a calcium channel in the endoplasmic reticulum to then release calcium to go do more work in the cell. So it's pretty cool, right? You're seeing reception, transduction, response. If you can remember that big picture, you can then apply it to the diagram that the AP test will give you. And we've done lots of practice in class. All right. Remember that throughout all of this, to see the whole forest, don't focus on a tree called IP3. Don't get uh, psyched out by one um, piece of information here in a transduction pathways. Try and see the big picture of what's happening in the cell. All right. Here's one. Um, ligand causing ion gated okay i'm sorry so the recepting uh the molecule the ligand causing the ion gated channels to open or close and so this is dealing with neurotransmitters and action potentials we haven't gone over that as much this year um they took the nervous system off of the ap test but we will go over it so here might be a uh, signaling molecule and it's going to cause this channel to open up and say that it lets a lot of sodium rush into the cell and that would cause a depolarization of the cell and cause an action potential all right, and here is an example of that with acetylcholine. All right, signal transduction topic uh, 4.3. Can you describe the role of the environment in eliciting the response and the different types of cell responses? So how does seeing a scary dog set off a uh, fight or flight in you? Um, so I've been talking in class. I've gotten into running in the last two years, um, rocking out some half marathons now. It's really changed my life. And... Uh, but I got bit by a dog and it was really scary. And I had a real uh, fight or flight syndrome in me. I mean, I still haven't gotten over it. I'll tell you what, if I see dogs on the road, it really scares me. Um, if the majority of your cells are the same DNA, how to respond to cells signals differently, right? And can you describe different cellular responses to ligands? This second one is just fascinating, right? If you start out as one fertilized egg and then through the process of mitosis in a cell cycle, make trillions of cells, but have the same DNA, well, how do you have some cells that are intestinal cells, some cells that are uh, neuro neurons, or some cells that are photoreceptors, and how do they respond to signals differently? Really cool stuff right there. All right, well, let's start with the first ones here. Going back, sorry. Um, the role of the environment. So you eat something, it's going to increase your blood glucose levels. Your pancreas senses this, and it's going to release insulin. Insulin is going to go throughout the body. Insulin is a protein-based uh, hormone, so it is uh, polar. It's going to dock with a receptor and cause your cells to bring about the GLUT4 receptor, which will bring uh, glucose into the cell, so it'll drop the levels, right? This is also going to get into feedback in the next one. So that's an example of responding to um, a change in the environment. Here's, here's what happened with me and that dog, right? So um, my... Eyes sensed it, it sent it to my hypothalamus, 
which then told my adrenal glands to make epinephrine. And epinephrine went throughout my body, of course, throughout my body, and it docks with an epinephrine receptor, which uh, then activated glycogen phosphorylase. And glycogen phosphorylase is going to chop up glycogen, which is a bunch of glucose stored together in my liver and in my muscles, and release it so that the glucose is there so that I can readily make more ATP in cellular respiration, so I can fight or flight. And what I tried to do was flight, but it didn't work too well. The dog bit me twice. Right. And so um, that is an example here of responding to the environment. All right. So let's talk about some of the outcomes that can happen. So you can activate the transcription of certain genes. You can activate certain enzymes. And so we've seen examples of both of those. The enzyme that was activated in the previous slide was glycogen phosphorylase. And other genes might cause a cell to divide. You can also activate apoptosis or cell death. It can say, OK, we need to get rid of this cell. Here's a question for you. How can the same signal promote different responses in different tissues? This is uh, tricky for students. So pause the video and think about it. Here's a picture of it. So here's epinephrine coursing throughout the body. In the intestines, it's going to constrict blood vessels. So it's going to push blood away from your intestines or your stomach. In your muscles, it's going to cause the vessels to dilate or to allow more blood to be there so that they, they can do stuff. And in your liver, it's going to do something completely different. It's going to help to break down glycogen. So here you might see that there's different receptors, right? These cells all have the same DNA, but they don't have to read or activate the same genes. Your eye cells activate genes coding for photoreceptors and lenses, et cetera, that are not activated in your liver. Your liver has those genes, has the genes to make um, a crystalline protein for your eye, but it doesn't do it because your liver doesn't need it. It doesn't have those transcription factors. And I'd like to thank a couple of the students in class that did wonderful case studies on how transcription factors play into lactose uh, tolerance or intolerance. So here they could have different receptors made by uh, different genes, but notice how the receptors would still bind with epinephrine, right? They had the same active site, but then they're gonna cause a different signal transduction pathway. Here, same receptors, but it causes a different response on the inside. So remember that the cell, these are in our different cells, they're activating different genes. They may have different internal proteins, right? So one signal, different effects in different cells. So here's uh, an example of it, right? And so these are my kids growing up. So they went from a fertilized zygote to divide by mitosis. And so here's my son, Johnny, and my daughter, Ellie. And here they are much bigger, right? And so they have, uh, made many copies of their cells, but they had the same DNA. But because different kinds of cells turn on different genes, different kinds of cells have different collections of proteins. This also answers the question of the same secondary messengers are used in many different cells, but the response can be different in each cell. How is this possible? Because they access different genes and they have different proteins. The way those different genes are accessed or regulated is part of unit six when we get to eukaryotic gene regulation. All right, we'll see another couple of examples. Um, the expression of the SRY gene triggers male uh, sexual development. Um, and the ethylene is gonna cause fruits to ripen. And we talked about um, acacia trees as well, uh, using that to produce tannins, so to protect themselves from giraffes. Um, and in here would be a developing uh, mouse um, foot. And so it's going to uh, get some signals to have apoptosis go down right here so that these cells die off so that way the digits can be separated. Um, here's a fascinating one dealing back to what Mr. Rowland said earlier with the uh, immune response. And here are going to be signals to, um, as T cells develop to um, if they react with your own body to undergo apoptosis, in other words, to die, right? We don't want these cells going out and hunting for viruses and antigens if they're going to react to our own cell types. And so this is why it's so hard with organ transplants, right? Because then you're you're trying to bring in an, an organ that's going to get attacked because it's not your cell type. And so this is called clonal selection. And so here um, we're signaling that we don't want those T cells. All right, can you explain how a change in the structure of any signaling molecule affects the activity of the signaling pathway? 
So how can changes in signal transduction pathways alter cellular responses? And the um, example I used in our class was uh, leptin. And so how does a mutation in a leptin receptor affect the mouse? How does a mutation in the actual production of the leptin uh, molecule change it, et cetera. And so it was from the National Center for Case Study Teaching and Science, and it was it's a cool PowerPoint one that we went through. Um, and leptin controls uh, whether or not you feel full, right? And so people that have malfunctioning leptin receptors will tend to be obese. And so here is an obese mouse that has a non-functional leptin receptor. And so it just keeps eating um, because it's never satiated. Um, there's also a whole class of endocrine disruptors. And so um, this is something I went over in my environmental science class, but uh, there's what we call um, a group of endocrine disruptors that mimic estrogen. So this is estrogen on the left, and here is bisphenol A, which goes in plastics. So you might have seen some stickers for um, this is BPA-free. And these uh, hydroxyl groups, these OHs, are near the same spots. And so it can sometimes dock with the um, estrogen receptor and cause a response in the uh, cell. And so this is uh, actually led to the feminization of amphibians, right? And so there's, um, and it's, it's uh, bisphenol A and atrazine is another one that does this. And so it can mess with um, the endocrine systems of animals that are affected by pollutants in our waterways. And it, it can also hurt humans as well. So um, these are some of the ways that a change in the structure of a signaling molecule can affect the activity of signaling pathway, right? So the leptin one, um, we went over it with a uh, severely obese uh, two-year-old and the two-year-old had a malfunction in the actual um, leptin molecule. So his receptors worked, but the leptin molecule uh, wasn't binding with the receptor. So there was a mutation in the leptin gene. So the child had injections of leptin. The problem is if there's a mutation in the leptin receptor, then it's going to be a lot harder to fix because injections of leptin won't fix it. All right. Some final tips uh, for a, the signal transduction pathways. When you're reading the uh, pathways, an arrow means activation. For example, this A is going to activate B. The blunt end arrow is means inhibition. So A is going to inhibit B here. And just like math, a negative times a negative is equal to a positive. So A is going to inhibit B, B inhibits C. So A actually activates or promotes C here. All right, we'll take a break now. Okay, we're on to topic 4.5, feedback. And so this is dealing with homeostasis. And so it's really going over negative feedback loops, positive feedback loops. Um, and what is homeostasis? So let's check it out. Homeostasis means uh, keeping things the same, right? Similar to standing still. And so a good example is body temperature. As your body temperature goes up, blood vessels will dilate, so that you, uh, you might sweat. Um, so you get rid of heat from your body and lose it to the environment and get back to normal. As your body temperature falls, right, you'll, you'll shiver, you'll, um, you won't sweat, and you will uh, uh, contract your muscles, trying to generate heat so that you can warm your body. All right, let's do um, more of a, an example with uh, cell signal. Right? So here, um, as your blood glucose goes up because you just ate a donut or something, um, or hopefully something healthy, right? You're going to release insulin so that the uh, glucose can be taken up and stored as glycogen in your liver and used for cellular respiration in your cells, which will make blood glucose go down. Here, let's say that your blood glucose goes down, like I am right now, I'm getting hungry, so my body's releasing glucagon. Um, glucagon is going to go to uh, my liver and it's going to help break down glycogen into glucose, release into the blood, so that way I will have uh, blood glucose there. So this is an example of um, homeostasis of a negative feedback loop, right? So it's trying to keep things normal. Here's an example of a positive feedback loop. And so a positive feedback loop is trying to amplify or transform the system. It is changing. So here the baby um, starts to push against the cervix. The nerve impulses from the cervix are transmitted to the brain. The brain is going to release oxytocin. Oxytocin is going to go to the uterus, which is going to stimulate contractions to push the baby's head more towards the cervix, which will then 
cause the brain to send the signal to make more oxytocin to cause uh, greater contractions. And so this will go until uh, the baby is out. And so that's the safest way to deliver a baby. So this is positive feedback, um, trying to amplify, transform, or change the system. Um, some other examples might be fruit ripening as well. Okay, here is an example of uh, that I drew out um, with insulin and glucagon. It's a little hard to read. I will definitely uh, cop to that. And so let me use my focus mouse. Here's insulin. Insulin comes and it docks with the insulin receptor. It's going to activate PKB, which inhibits GSK3, which inhibits glycogen synthase. So if you remember my double negative uh, earlier, this uh, insulin is actually going to, or PKB is actually going to promote glycogen synthase, which will promote uh, glycogen formation. So that makes sense. Now let's see how this ties into feedback. So glucagon down here is the triangle. Sorry, it's covered up right now. It's going to activate PK, which is going to activate glycogen phosphorylase. We talked about that earlier when I got bit by that dog. That's going to uh, activate or cleave glycogen into glucose 1-phosphate, into glucose 6-phosphate, which will then go off to glycolysis. Glycolysis is the start of cellular respiration to make energy. But notice how glucose 6-phosphate inhibits glycogen phosphorylase. So here is a negative feedback loop. Right? It's going to stop glycogen phosphorylase, so the end product in the pathway is going to inhibit uh, this step in the pathway, so it's going to stop it down. So that is an example of homeostasis or negative feedback. All right, let's see if I can turn this off. We are now on to the cell cycle. And so the cell cycle is dealing with mitosis and making copies of cells. So here are my questions to you. Can you describe it? Can you construct an explanation for how the cell cycle transmits chromosomes from one generation to the next? You need some terminology for this. Um, we're gonna get into meiosis, you know, the formation of sex cells in unit five, but right now we are dealing with diploid in humans, two sets of chromosomes, somatic body cells, so these. Right, so they've got um, 23 pairs of chromosomes, or 46 chromosomes, 23 from mom and 23 from dad. Sex cells are just going to have one set of chromosomes, and those are called gametes. So mitosis deals with diploid somatic body cells. Um, you do need to know that a chromosome is, is not just this X-shaped uh, structure, right? This is a chromatid, and this is a chromatid on each side. They're identical copies of each other. But what they really are is DNA wound around histone proteins. So it's important to realize that chromosome is made up of DNA wrapped around proteins. And that inside the nucleus, it's just going to exist as um, like a chromatic. So kind of like spaghetti in a bowl is what I told my students. So let's talk about the goal of the cell cycle is to transmit um, the exact copy of the genetic information to the cell. So here's my son um, and he's growing, right? And he's uh, going to end up being taller than me, I bet. And so he's using the cell cycle to make copies of his cells. It's going to repair tissue. So when he falls and cuts himself and it will help um, bacteria and uh, protists, et cetera, to engage in asexual reproduction. Mitosis is a universal eukaryotic property. It rose at the base of the eukaryotic phylogenetic tree and it evolved from binary fission in prokaryotes, which we'll go over at the end. All right. What are the steps of the cell cycle? So they are G1, S, and G2. Those comprise interphase. Those take the majority of the cell cycle. If the cell cycle is um, many cells divide in 24 hours, so this would be like 22 and a half hours of it. And so we'll go over what each of those mean in just a second. Mitosis is going to take about 90 minutes and it's going to com be comprised of uh, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Some um, books include prometaphase in there as a, a stage as well. You don't need to memorize the names of the stages per se for. Uh, the AP test, but I do think you, you need to understand what's going on because it's important for how the genetic information is transmitted. And the cytokinesis is uh, the cells cleaving in two. Cells can exit G1 and interphase and rest at gap zero, like neuronal cells do. All right, let's look at interphase. So in G1, a cell is growing. Um, it's doing the processes of being a cell and um, whatever it needs to accomplish. During the S uh, phase, it's going to copy its DNA. And so we'll 
it's a whole unit in and of itself of how DNA is copied. And in G2, the cell is going to prepare to divide. We are now moved on to mitosis. And so we're in prophase, and I remember P for prep. So the chromatin is going to condense into chromosomes, that X-shaped structure, the central separates, bindles, fibers begin to form, and a nuclear membrane breaks down. During metaphase, the chromosomes are going to line up in the middle of the cell. These are identical to each other, right? These chromatids. So these, this would be that X-shaped structure of a chromosome, and this is going to be identical to this one. All right, and so they're going to be connected uh, to, at the kinetic core by spindle fibers. Um, they're then going to be walked along these spindle fibers towards the poles, and that's going to be what happens during anaphase. So if you had here, this is um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight chromosomes. So this is two n is equal to eight. Here, you could briefly say that there's um, 16 chromosomes here if you were to count them up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, because they're no longer connected, right? But they're quickly going to reform um, the nuclear membranes in telophase. The chromosomes will lose their distinct shapes. They'll go back to chromatin. And now you have the two new cells. And it's ready to uh, go through G1 and to do the work of being a cell and then to divide again when needed. All right, so that's the cell cycle um, very quickly. Um, there's a lots of uh, practice questions in Khan Academy and in um, AP Classroom that you should definitely try with these um, to practice these different stages. Here um, from OpenStax is binary fission in prokaryotes. So it has a circular strand of DNA. Um, it will copy itself starting the origin replication. It will go both ways around the DNA strand. Um, the DNA strands will move towards the other ends of the cells and then the cell will cleave. And so you can see how um, mitosis evolved from this. All right, last topic here, regulation of the cell cycle. And so this is really important, right? And so how is the cell cycle regulated and how does cancer happen? So the cell cycle is regulated um, by three checkpoints, the G1, the G2, and the M checkpoint. In the G1 checkpoint, the cell is going to assess whether or not its DNA is good. Um, whether or not it has the adequate reserves or um, the energy to divide, um, whether or not it has received a message that it needs to divide as well. During the G2 phase, you can see that it's just gone through uh, S phase, it's gone through synthesis. So in G2, it's going to check that the DNA was properly duplicated. If it wasn't, if something went wrong during DNA synthesis, the cell will undergo apoptosis and die. In the M checkpoint, we're going to make sure that there's proper attachment of each kinetic core to a spindle fiber so that way that the uh, chromatids are pulled apart correctly right so this happens in the m phase oh i forgot to tell you like one way to remember the cell uh cycle you could do g1 s g2 is getting ready prophase metaphase the chromosomes line up in the middle anaphase they pull apart and then telophase you got two separate ones this is going to be regulated by cyclins. And so cyclins are going to promote uh, the different mo stages of the cell cycle. You don't need to memorize the names of the cyclins or the complexes, but you should understand in general what's going on. So cyclins are proteins, and they're made. And when they are made, they're going to, oh, no. Oh, no. Come back. They're going to combine with cyclic-dependent kinases. So here is the cyclodependent kinase for um, going from G1 to S. And so here is the cyclin to, to promote that. When it combines with the cyclodependent kinase, this will actually get phosphorylated as well. Then this kinase can go off and phosphorylate other proteins. So notice how with no cyclin here, these target proteins are not phosphorylated to begin the S phase, right? These are enzymes that are going to help with DNA replication. Remember that phosphates are negatively charged, right? They're going to cause a conformational change here in this protein. So as the number of cyclins rise up, then the cell will then go off and do that part of the cell cycle. So that was um, cyclin B or E. Um, here, let's look at the M cyclin. So the M cyclin is going to promote mitosis, right? And so here, um, as the M cyclin rises up in numbers, it's going to combine with the cyclin-dependent kinase. It will then phosphorylate these different targets, 
and it will start to do the work of uh, mitosis. These cyclins will get degraded after they're used up, but the cyclin dependent kinases will stick around, right? The CDKs are always around. They're just waiting for the right number of cyclins to come along. All right, let's go over a couple of ways that this can uh, cause cancer. And so here is uh, a famous gene called P53. P53 is called the um, guardian of the genome. And so if P53 detects DNA damage, it will initiate the creation of a CDK inhibitor. And so it will say, no, 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 this CDK cyclone complex cannot work. Even though there are cyclones here telling the cell to go on, there was damage in that DNA. We need to pause the cell. We either need to fix the damage or we need to blow up this cell. We need to kill it with apoptosis. Here is an example of an oncogene. So an oncogene is like a gas pedal. It says, let's go. And so if the oncogene has a mutation, it can become a proto-oncogene or a proto-oncogene becomes an oncogene. And so it's going to then constantly cause this um, uh, pathway to be on. Even in the absence of the growth factor, notice how um, this is constantly being on. And so it's going to constantly cause the cell to divide. So you can think about oncogenes as mutations in gas pedals. And then here is a mutation in a tumor suppressor gene. So that was like I went over with P53. So there's no breaks to the cell cycle. So oncogenes are like gas pedals and uh, tumor suppressor genes are like breaks. All right, students, take care. Hope you enjoyed unit four. Have a good one.